I don't know why Netflix continues to get behind these so clearly biased documentaries when you could easily do a documentary about the the problems associated with the food system and 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 what's really going on with public health luke cook what up welcome back to the show how you doing so happy to be here max so unhappy to have watched you are what you eat this week knowing that we were going to talk about it you were like i want to do a podcast i'm like i really don't want to watch it but i did um and me and my wife were watching it and just at different points just uh, annoyed at this this bloody thing we had to watch. How did it make you feel? Did it make you feel like the worst person in the world for being an omnivore? You know, I just felt like it was preaching and you didn't get a chance to have have a say. <laughs> it was like, oh, like somebody said a fact. Like at one point there was a woman who was uh, a Japanese woman who makes uh, dairy alternatives. She makes a, a grass fed, I, I don't know, she makes a, a cheese out of cashews or something. And she, and she, she said throughout human history, no one really ate meat. I go, and I'm like, oh, we're just going to skim over that, are we? <laughs> no one's going to fact check that? Like, we're not going to talk about the fact that she just said no one throughout human history really ate meat? I'm like, what are you talking about? Mm. And that was the frustration I felt. I'm like, well, wait, wait, somebody should say something to her. Mm-hmm. <laughs> but it's just like these uh, these these little lies just kind of skimmed over. Oh it yeah, like, it's know. a v- it presents a very one one-sided argument. Mm-hmm. In yeah. favor very clearly in favor of veganism, but when you actually look at who funded the series on mm-hmm. Netflix, when you look at the track records of the scientists involved, I mean it's very clear where that bias comes from. Yeah. I mean the whole miniseries is a production of OPS. Mm-hmm. It says very very subtly at the beginning of the of the show that it's an OPS production. OPS is Oceanic Preser- the Oceanic Preservation Society, mm-hmm. which was founded by Louis Silhos. I think that's how you pronounce his name, but I'm not 100% sure. He was the director of The Cove, mm-hmm. which was another pro-vegan documentary. Right. I'm not saying he doesn't do important work, but he's a well-known. He creates vegan-focused content. He himself yeah. is a vegan. I spoke at a conference, um, and he <laughs> took the stage after me, actually. We were both speakers at the same. It was Aspen Brain Lab a couple years ago. Mm. And I went up there, and I mentioned that grass-fed beef for you know as as one of the many foods that I was talking about mm-hmm. in that in that talk that I gave but I was saying how it's rich in antioxidants it's a great source of protein he actually when he took the stage he he laughed at the fact that the prior speaker mentioned that there were antioxidants in red meat he scoffed at at my assertion that red meat is a very healthful food right so he's well known for being a, a vegan he's also working on this Dean Ornish documentary last I heard um, which he's an, uh, Dean Ornish is another well-known vegan uh, dietary evangelist. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah, there's a lot of bias baked yeah. into that into that series and funded by tech billionaires uh, like I think his name is Carl Vogt or Vote that he mm-hmm. might be pronounced V O G T, and he is known to be part of the vegan mafia. Mm. They've named themselves, which is just all these billionaires who invest in vegan companies, and they put a million dollars into game changes and they invested in OPS too. And he recently got, he recently retired from GM because he was making a driverless car, but it was really unsafe. Mm. Um, That was just a little side note to say he sucks. He sucks. sucks. He's trying to kill us. Uh, I actually have a quote here. Charlie Vaught, who is the secretary treasurer at the Vaught foundation, Mm said literally that the foundation funds organizations that protect animals and promote plant-based products. Mm -hmm. So this is the foundation that funded, that played a role in funding the Stanford study Mm -hmm. on which this miniseries is based, um, and uh, as well as the series itself. And the Stanford plant-based initiative. Yeah. um, Which is a, I'm like, well, this is pure agenda. Mm -hmm. There's no... The people doing the study are the Stanford Plant-Based Initiative. The secret's in the name, you know. <laughs> they don't want to find out that omnivore is better than vegan. No. They aren't out to find that out. No, they'll, they'll bend over backwards to prove the mm-hmm. opposite, right? That veganism, that veganism is, is superior. Mm-hmm. So the miniseries, I mean, it, it, it basically documents the journey of a small subset of the twins that are involved in the Stanford Twins stu- study mm-hmm. where they yeah. took twins and they put they put one on a quote unquote healthy omnivorous diet they put the other twin on a quote unquote healthy vegan diet and they compared 
outcomes, right? And so this the mini series basically documents the journey of a small subset. I think it's like four or five pairs. Mm-hmm. Um, and there were much more than that, weren't there? There were more like than that. 22 pairs of twins, I think. Yeah, there were more than that. Um, and the study sought to, to authoritatively um, determine which is the healthier diet, right? Mm-hmm. And I think at the outset, Christopher Gardner, who's the head Stanford researcher involved in the design, involved in the reporting of the, you know, of, of the study, he's all over the, the, the Netflix miniseries. He, he, you know, makes the assertion that vegan diets are often compared to the standard American diet. Mm -hmm. So what they sought to try to prove was that a vegan diet is actually healthier than even a well-planned quote unquote healthy diet that is inclusive of animal products. Right. But when you actually look at the study when you actually go into the supplementary material, which is available for all to see. I mean, you can look up the Stanford Twin study. I think it's supplement two or B. It's like one of the two. Um, you can go and I actually see the macronutrient distribution, the calorie intake, the mm. fiber distribution, Brit, all all really actually elegantly broken down. But what, what becomes really clear is that the vegan twins were actually, they were consuming fewer calories, about 200 fewer calories, mm-hmm. which is significant, yeah. right? They were consuming a lot less saturated fat. They were consuming a lot more dietary fiber. And so it wasn't it wasn't a trial where they controlled for calories. Right. So right there off the top, that, di- that trial is unable to prove that one is healthier than the other because there was a caloric yeah. difference. Because you could, technically you could get a drop in HDL C from just eating less calories. You can get a drop in HDL from eating, yeah, from eating less. Well, yeah, you can get, and you'll get a drop in HDL from eating less saturated fat. And we think that HDL is actually healthy, right. that it's reflective of good health, of good right. metabolic health. Actually, one of the m- markers that they use to ascertain metabolic health is they look at HDL. They don't even look at LDL. Right. Higher HDL is thought to be um, predictive of good health. You can't yeah. artificially manipulating it. Um, doesn't necessarily lead to better health outcomes. They've had drugs that have uh, been proven to raise um, HDL, and that doesn't lead to better outcomes. Mm-hmm. But nonetheless, higher HDL seems to be better than lower HDL. Yeah. Now, clarify for people at home. Actually, clarify for me. <laughs> Two, HDL would be con- is, is considered the good cholesterol. I know this pisses people off when, if you really know what you're talking about, people get upset. Like It's like, it's not bad. Hey, it's not bad cholesterol. There's no good cholesterol. It's like there's some mechanism by which it's not bad or it's not good but hdl we want we want it high and ldl we don't want it too elevated is that right yeah i mean i think that's that's fair to say ldl first of all neither hdl nor ldl is cholesterol right right? to to be really accurate they're both lipoproteins that carry cholesterol and triglycerides around the body Mm mm-hmm all things being equal, it's thought that higher LDL is more predictive of cardiovascular risk, risk for, you know, atherosclerotic cardiovascular disease. But, um, but you know, this this sect of veganism that uh, basically will look for any data point to confirm their biases because they're inevitably, you know, on these very low saturated fat diets. Mm-hmm. A- eating animal fat of any sort typically will lead to higher levels of LDL as compared to somebody who's on a no animal fat diet because right. saturated fat is a does tend to increase um, LDL. But these you see these vegan dietary evangelists asserting that we should be as adults walking around with the LDL of a newborn. And right. that's just not physiologically, it doesn't make any sense. Yeah. Um, I mean, there was a study that I shared on Instagram recently where they found, it was a study from the 90s, they found that breastfed babies had higher LDL compared to babies on formula. Mm-hmm. So the fact that we're demonizing, breast breast milk is the perfect food yes. for a newborn. Yes. So the fact that we're demonizing LDL, yeah. it just doesn't make any sense. I'm not saying that it's not important. I'm not saying that we should be walking around like some of these carnivore advocates, you know, walking around with LDL in the hundreds, right? Right. But this idea that there's no safe level of LDL, um, to me is just nonsense. Yeah. It it is funny to you did say like having the LDL levels of a newborn. I'm like I think newborns would have pretty good LDL considering breast milk is lactase and fat. Yeah, yeah, like, pretty mean, it's, much. It's yeah, breast milk is rich in saturated fat. Yeah, like all dairy is. I did find it funny and uh, watching the first episode, whenever they did mention a standard American diet, they showed meat, and I was like, but 
I, I wouldn't consider meat to be the standard American diet. When I think of the standard American diet, I think of maybe hamburgers and fries. So there is an element of meat in there, but it's actually a small proportion of that. I think of more processed foods of which meat is not a processed food. Yeah. And so whenever they mentioned standard American diet, I thought it was very clever of the documentarians to go, showed meat. In yeah. whatever, and I was like, but that's not a, that's not a processed food. And whenever they did mention processed food, they mentioned saturated fat. And I go, oh, and I was thinking, but actually saturated fat isn't that high in ultra processed foods. Usually it's higher in sugar and filler and refined carbohydrates yeah. and high in, you know, polyunsaturated fats than just saturated fats. Yeah, seed oils. Right. Yeah, so we're blaming the meat for what the fries, what the sugar-sweetened beverages right. have done to the U.S. population. Mm -hmm. That's such a good point that you bring up. Like, you know, the Americans are by and large on plant-based diets. Like 60% of the calories that your average American consumes today come from ultra-processed foods. And these foods are by and large plant-based because they're, that makes them cheap to produce. Right. The margins are through the roof. They're highly profitable. Mm -hmm. And actually, if you look statistically, our consumption of beef at the population level has actually plummeted yes. over the past few decades. Mm -hmm. And yet population health has gotten worse and worse and worse. So we are eating less beef. Yep. We're eating less beef and we've never seen the rates of obesity, of type two diabetes, of chronic disease that we've ever seen. And you might you might be able to achieve a lower LDL. You, pr you likely will achieve a lower LDL on a plant-based diet, but at what cost, yes. right? You're ingesting less Protein, typically we see that, mm -hmm. right? The protein that you are ingesting is of lower quality. Mm -hmm. It's not, I mean, we've talked about protein quality. We talked about it on the last time you were, the on the last episode Yep. Um, that you were on. For and, anyone uh, interested in that, it's the DIAAS score. And you can look up whatever protein you're taking or any food source really and see that every food source has a DIAAS score. It's essentially how much your body utilizes any given protein. And a milk protein or a whey or a beef will be really high, and then a soy or a uh, you know pea or quinoa will be quite low. Yeah, exactly. And actually when this, what this uh, Netflix series, You Are What You Eat, um, found even at the uh, on the last episode, they, they utilized DEXA scans to look at the body composition of the participants. Mm. And what they found was that the, the vegan dieters lost muscle but of course they swept that under the rug oh but that's major i did see that they'd lost weight they lost yeah. like four four point three pounds more than every than the omnivores did yeah but i didn't know that they did take into a consideration my first question was where did that weight come from yeah. did it come from fat because that's great or did it come from muscle and chances are because you were on a low lower protein diet you lost muscle mm -hmm. which isn't good yeah i mean yeah. especially if you're in a calorie deficit which obviously these the the vegans were if they lost weight, right? And mm -hmm. we know that they ate fewer calories mm -hmm. by about 200, 200 fewer calories, kilocalories. They also ate less protein and protein becomes even more valuable if you are in a calorie deficit because you're essentially in a catabolic state. So your body's like deciding where to take those additional calories from. You want to keep your protein levels high so mm -hmm. as to maintain muscle. And so we saw that the vegan group, some of them were able to maintain, a few of them lost muscle which again is not good, right? Mm -hmm. And the omnivores, they gained. They gained. And something about the 200 calorie, which I thought was interesting to think about is out of the, so I think there were 22, so half of the twins did vegan. 21 of them said at the end of the, at the, end of the study, I will not continue to be vegan. One said, I might continue to be vegan. So there's a possibility that they were so, that they, they had such dissatisfaction with the diet. They found that they were so dissatisfied with the diet that maybe they were eating less because it was just like, I don't want to eat this. <laughs> yeah. Like, I just don't want to eat any more of this. Yeah. You know? We know that, yeah, we saw dietary satisfaction was lower in mm -hmm. the vegan group. And I think some vegan activists on social media um, thought that that was likely attributable to the fact that eating out becomes more difficult when you're when you're on a plant-based diet but nonetheless mm -hmm. i mean dietary it's right there in the data dietary satisfaction as a whole is lower mm -hmm. um which is important in terms of sustainability and also just enjoying life yeah. right so there was that they also had a, a a trend towards um higher levels of fasting triglycerides which is a risk factor for heart disease mm. um lower hdl mm -hmm. and uh and lower HDL, that's the good cholesterol. So that even though their bad cholesterol went down, which is good, uh, their good cholesterol went down too. Yeah. So they 
that's not good. Yeah, and also right. like these are just biomarkers that we're talking right. about. Like we don't actually know about long-term health outcomes, right? I think mm -hmm. it's important for people to understand that like seeing a drop in LDL, like we, you know, we've been kind of um, indoctrinated into thinking that that's a health win, but we don't actually know how that plays out over the long term, right? We know that at the population level, lower LDL seems to be an independent risk factor for cardiovascular disease, but that's in the context of the standard American diet again. Mm -hmm. So also, it didn't really clarify like LDLC doesn't just seem to be one thing where it's like oh, it's a bad thing that you should have low a low amount of. Um, a recent systematic review of 19 cohort studies of 68,000 people found that the higher the LDL, the longer that they lived. Hmm. Uh, the largest cohort study done, those with the highest LDLC lived longer than those on statins. So why won't the media tell us that? Like, why, why don't we hear that story? Yeah. I mean, I think all that illustrates is that it's way more complicated than these dietary evangelists covert activists want to mm -hmm. lead on. Again, I think the fo they put the focus, they become myopically fixated on LDL and now ApoB, which is, you know, LDL is a subfraction of, of ApoB, which is again, another lipoprotein. Um, but they do that because that is part of the, that's one of the key tenets of their dietary religion. Mm -hmm. Yeah. You know, that LDL is the end all be all indicator of human health, right? Yeah. But we don't know if you, if you, you know, calibrate your diet and lifestyle so as to attain the LDL level of a newborn, like ultimately everybody dies, right? So like, it's not like we're escaping death, right? Right. So what else is going to get you, right? Yes, is it yes, going to be yes. the fall that right. takes you out mm -hmm. after you've achieved, <laughs> you know, sarcopenic levels of muscle because of your low protein diet, mm -hmm. your brittle bones, you know, is it going to be the, the, the depression that gets you? <laughs> like, yeah. So there's all these other factors and to just make it to make it solely about LDL cholesterol, mm -hmm. um, which again, like I, I love to just kind of bring this up because I think it's so important. And again, I'm not one of these like cholesterol denialists. I think that like it's it's important, right? It's not yeah. it's not not important, but mm -hmm. cardiovascular disease is multifactorial, right? There's not one cause. Right. And um, and LDL is not just a biomarker. It's an industry. Mm. So, you know, we have drugs that are worth billions of dollars, the most prescribed drug class in the world, statin drugs, right? Like Lipitor, Crestor, all those drugs that our grandparents, parents likely take, you mm -hmm. know? Yeah. Um, there's billions of dollars associated with that. And then you throw into the mix the, the, the commerce from the food industry side. Yeah. The fact that plant-based alternatives are worth millions, if not billions of dollars at this point. And then you throw in the politics, mm -hmm. you know? And we know that politics, unfortunately, infuse the mandates of the of higher education in this country now at this point yep and, and the prison system any school system so you even saw in that there's cory booker the u.s senator is in it and mm -hmm. it's like okay well okay well you don't know what you're talking about with, with diet you don't know what you're talking about i don't know you know you're a politician the only reason you would be in this documentary if there's an agenda to be pushed here and there clearly is because there's a politician sitting in the chair telling us about diet. There you go. Right? I'm just like, what are you doing here? Yeah, exactly. You know? Um, yeah, the idea that there's an agenda behind it is, is, is blatantly obvious. And I think you posted recently, like, why do you, somebody said, why do you get into vegans more than carnivores? And you said, because the vegan agenda is so much more pervasive mm. and, uh, you know, possibly more harmful, but it's definitely got more money behind it. Like there's so much money behind it. We don't know that these vegan mafia are actually vegan. We don't know that Kurt Vogt is actually eating Beyond Meat. Guess, chances are, looking at their stock, he's not eating it. Hmm. Nobody really is. And, you know, I, I somebody said about the, uh, the World Health Organization, do as they do, not what they say. <laughs> the way they eat, that's how you should eat. Yeah. You know, when those guys go over to, to Switzerland and have that, that group meeting of all the billionaires, they're all eating steak. Yeah. And they all get there on their private jets. And then they get there and tell us we're going to eat crickets. <laughs> it's like, do as they do, don't do as they say. 100%. You know? 100%. Yeah. yeah. They, they, I mean, and to be fair, I've seen some vegan activists push back actually about the fact that the, the miniseries um, on Netflix did in the end end up piling on all of the activist stuff you mm -hmm. know I, I think a lot of people even even from that from that diet tribe felt that they should have kept it focused on the study mm -hmm. right instead of making it about this like this guilt trip at the end yep for the planet for all that stuff 
But um, but you can't escape that today. I mean, the fact that the fact that our diets have become so politicized and, and yes, and even fitness now has become politicized in a way. And there's something emotional about the planet idea too. And you know, so you mentioned it's a religious, it's a cult. And if you go to any big church over here, there's many. Um, Hillsong, Mosaic. It's all about turning the lights down, getting an amazing musical experience, ramping up that volume, getting you to sing, which naturally opens up like your throat chakra or whatever, and you begin to emotionally give in to whatever's going on. And these documentaries do the same thing. It's like music up, you know, dist- like a distraught image on the, and then you're like, you're there, you're gone, you know, and it's like it emotionally tries to grab you. And if they didn't do that, but they'd be stupid in many ways. They, mm. they, they've got that as a tool. Mm. They're not going to like just ignore the emotional and just do the scientific, which by the way, the scientific is just not there. They have to focus on the emotional because the scientific is so, I, I said to you off air, I, I can't believe that they published it. Like it's because the LDL did go down, but the HDL, which is the good bit, went down too. The triglycerides went up, which is the bad bit. They were dissatisfied with the diet. Um, a, a huge proportion of them were women. LDLC does not affect like it affects men for cardiovascular problems. The problems are right there in the study. The fact that they lost weight and like it's probably muscle. Like it's like, I can't believe you gave us that information. Yeah. Like, you know that we're going to look at it, take it apart like we're doing right now. I'm just amazed that they published it, frankly. Yeah. Like it's like, it didn't do well for them. I, I feel like they also thought that it was probably going to be like the the holy grail of nutrition studies, at least to the to the scientifically uninformed by the fact that it was a twin study. Mm. But genetics don't really play all that large of a role in terms of how your average person is going to respond to food, especially today in the context of like modern problem. Right. Like the, the modern problems of widespread severe obesity, mm-hmm. right? Like... You really don't, genes don't really play that large of a role when it comes to, well, you're just likely eating too much. You right. know, you're eating too much fast food. You're eating too many ultra processed foods. Yes. You know, I mean, like there is this whole field of nutrigenomics, which is in its infancy, you know, like the the notion of hyper-personalized nutrition. Mm-hmm. But at the end of the day, I mean, I think the the, 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 the problem, the problems are really simple. And it's that we're eating too many ultra processed foods. Yeah. And um, and I think that's big. Also, like genetics are just one part of the factor. Like even even between twins, there's microbiome differences. Mm. There are fitness differences. Mm. So they're yeah. not controlling for what they think that they're controlling for. Like yeah. the microbiome plays a huge role. Yeah. In the way that we assimilate, digest, and respond to different foods. And how they picked the twins. Like what were their previous blood work, and what had they previously been eating? And then they chose who was going to be omnivorous and who was going to be vegan. They didn't, the vegans, did, the, the, the twins didn't choose. Hmm. They chose for them, hmm. gave them slips and go, this is who's going to do which. So yeah. it's entirely possible that their previous blood work was like, oh, this one has a lower LDL. We may as well make them the vegan. Um, I, you know what? I, I, did, I did think out of, if I had one, a few positive things to say about it, I liked the twins. I really grew to like them. The twins are great. They're so cute. Yeah. Oh my God, I want to hug each and every one of them. And I do think as well, though, um, and I'd like to hear your thoughts on this ethically, the inhumane treatment of animals isn't something that sits particularly well with me. Mm-hmm. And I go out of my way to make sure that I buy as good a quality meat as I can. But as you've mentioned before, I think, you know, buy as good as you can. And... Are we really going to turn a blind eye to the factory farming industry for people who maybe can't afford a regenerative or a grass fed or anything like that? What do you think about that? Yeah, no, I, I completely agree. I mean, I try to buy from small farms. I try to buy meat for my for my home. So when I'm all bets are off when I'm eating out, right? I try to do the yes. best that I can um, in the restaurant environment, which usually is going to be the whatever grilled piece of meat is available, right? Yeah. Um. But for in terms of what I bring into my house, I try to buy only I try to buy 100% grass fed, grass finished from farms that I'm, you know, that I that I am familiar with. That's not always the case. Mm -hmm. Um, But, you know, you 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 tend to see like, for example, if you were to buy bison, bison doesn't have the kind of feedlot infrastructure associated with it that that. bovine meat does you know that cow yes that beef does totally um 
So I think, you know, you can, that, that goes a long way. Um, I also don't, you know, I mean, I, as a rule, I don't, I'll never eat like foie gras. I don't eat Uh, veal, anything like that. So Mm -hmm. I think that you can be an ethical, kind, animal welfare concerned omnivore. Yes. But that, it's just like gaslighting to, you know, to, to hear that, that, that that's a contradiction in terms. It's Mm -hmm. not a contradiction in terms. You can, and I think ultimately, um, ethically, the impetus is on you to, to feed to, to eat and to feed your loved ones, your family, the kinds of foods that we know are biologically appropriate. And yeah. animal source foods are, there's just no question to me that, that we are adapted to consume animal source foods. It's yep. just, there's this big, I mean, I don't want to call it a conspiracy, but there's this big global agenda now to move us away from those kinds of ancestral foods, mm-hmm. new to the most nutrient dense foods available to your average person and push us towards this, you know, hyper privileged, you know, amalgamation of supplements and ultra processed foods to try to replicate Mm -hmm. a diet that can so simply be, you know, optimized with animal source foods. Yeah. I was recently, um, somebody lashed out at me on the internet because I, I said when people bring junk food into our house and from time to time they do, they'll come over for a party or something and, or a birthday and they'll bring a big cake and it's like, they'll leave, they'll leave the junk food with us. And I'm like, do you wish and so sometimes i'm like could you just take it and they're like no no no, you have it and i'm like ah Hmm. and now i've got like a half eaten bag of doritos or this giant cake and i was saying on the internet i said i I throw it away like i just toss it because nobody needs it like my mother-in-law who lives with us she's pre she was she was pre-diabetic and had high cholesterol and i'm like well she not she doesn't need to eat it my kids don't need to eat it i don't need to eat it so i'm throwing it away and somebody was like that's a very privileged position that you get to throw it away. Why don't you donate it? I'm like, am I going to donate a half a cake? <laughs> like, don't you think that's a bit condescending? And don't you think it's further condescending to feed, to give away food that you wouldn't eat to somebody that you would just assume would? You should be giving away food that you would eat. Yeah, That's when it means something. Mm. Um, but, but furthermore, I thought I have also, I work really hard to be able to afford the food that we can afford. Like it is my, like, it is a high uh, priority to me to shop and get the best food that I possibly can for my family. Like I really put most of my money towards that goal. And I understand that not everyone's going to have the same priorities, but that's just the, the privilege idea was like, it is a privilege that I know what I can go and buy. That's really important for my family and good for my family. It is, a, it is a privilege and not everyone has that. Um, at the same time, I think that this idea of privilege is automatically bad. And I, when I say it is a privilege to go and buy those foods, I think it's good. Like mm. I'm so happy to have that privilege. Yeah. You know, you know, one thing that, um, that I do now when I go over to friends houses, I used to, the, the, the de facto gift to bring to a friend when you're going to say a dinner at a friend's home, mm-hmm. you bring a bottle of wine, yeah. right? Yeah. I actually think that a much better gift um, which I don't know anybody who else who's doing this, but we're going to normalize this here on this episode of the show. I bring a bot, a nice fancy bottle of extra virgin olive oil. <laughs> yeah. It's very ancient Greek. Yeah. <laughs> but it's great. They, <laughs> yeah. they appreciate it. And it's like, you know, if you think about it, I mean, I drink wine. I'm, you know, I drink occasional glass of wine. Sure. Love dry farm wines. I drink it, um, occasionally, not often, but, um, but essentially, you know, alcohol is a toxin, right? It's a neuro, it's like ethanol we know is a neurotoxin. There's really no ideal level of alcohol consumption Mm -hmm. why not bring a bottle of like a really nice extra virgin olive oil i agree that like your guests can keep on as a centerpiece like on their on their dining room table and there are some beautiful bottles out there right now yeah i I go past whole foods i'm like look at that i've been doing it and their guests are always super appreciative and they're like and they're surprised it's like wow that is such a wonderful gift and then when you go back a second time you should take the you know the the bulk ones that you can buy. So then you can just fill up the bottle with that. Yeah, exactly. That's how I buy it. We, we have this great little squeezy bottle. I forget the name of the olive oil. It's new, but it's a squeezy bottle like chefs use. And then we just buy great bulk olive oil and just fill that up. Yeah. It just seems to be the way to go instead it's, of buying individual bottles all the time. It's a great idea. And then you can talk about the health benefits associated with extra virgin olive oil. I mean, yep. it's a super healthy food. Mm-hmm. It's delicious. Um. Yeah. It's such. A, it's a much better gift than junk food, cake. Yeah. And and wine. I think. I, I do feel like people like palm it off on families. Like <laughs> people are like, well, they'll eat it. And it's like actually no, you won't eat it. <laughs> yeah. One hundred percent. Yeah. 
The other red flag, I think, is, I mean, just in the name of the, of the miniseries alone, right? You are what you eat. Like You're a plant? Yeah. No. <laughs> I'm meat. <laughs> yeah, right? Yes, exactly. I want to be lean protein, so I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to base my diet around lean protein. Yes. I'm not a tomato. Yeah. <laughs> no, totally. I, uh, I, I also just looked at the people who they had on there as experts. Mm. From time to time, there'd be a nutrition and um, social sciences. And it's like, oh, okay, so there's a social sciences in there. <laughs> you know, it's, it's not about actually the nutrition, you know. Um, yeah. And there was something mentioned about the gut microbiome that essentially if you don't get plant carbohydrates, your gut starts to eat itself. Did you see that bit? <laughs> well, you need fiber. I mean, they've the Stanford, the Stanford, um, the Sonnenberg lab. It's a husband and wife. They're microbiologists. They've done a lot of really important microbiome research. Mm -hmm. And it's true that dietary fiber seems to be, you know, like a, a, it, it, it tends to lead to a more robust mucosa, which is really important yep. Yep. in terms of immune function, gut health. But we, you know, in the, we, and I talked about this recently with, a, I had an incredible Aussie uh, doctor on the show. Dr. Dr. Pran. Yoga Nathan. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. Gastroenterologist. Oh, wow. Expert in yeah. all things gut health. Yeah. And he was saying that it's really misguided to put the focus on fiber without presenting the necessary context that, you know, m many people have impaired gut microbiomes, right? Yeah. So to just like load people up or, ins or instruct people to, to load up on the dietary fiber, right? Yep. Um, without the important caveat that like most people have impaired gut microbiomes and, you know, just suddenly overnight going from whatever the average is, you know, five to 10 grams of fiber a day that your average American is consuming to the, I don't know, like the 150 grams of fiber that yeah. some of these plant-based advocates assert that we need on a daily basis. I mean, that's a recipe for bloating, for constipation. Oh, wait, I, I, I get caused pain where I, whenever I take like a psyllium husk or I take a thing called uh, super gut, which has a uh, high amounts of resistant starch in it. I always like, if I take too much and I'm not ready for it, I'm in pain. Mm. Like it hurts. So I think you've got to do that you got to build up actually. I yeah. think you've got to half dose it until then. But it seems like for fiber in the gut, it seems that probiotics, and uh, it, it's their food. They eat prebiotics, which is the resistant starch, the fibers, et cetera. So they actually, you actually need to have probiotics there to eat those things and make it worthwhile. Yeah, healthy gut bacteria, you need that. Right. Yeah. Now, is there a, a line between fiber in the diet um, and LDL? Yeah, so fiber, I mean, fiber, Fiber, there are many benefits to consuming more fiber. So I'm a big fan of fiber. And mm -hmm. I wrote about this in my first book, Genius Foods, which came out, you know, six years ago at this point. Fiber is really important for balancing hormones, um, for, I mean, it can reduce LDL, um, but in a really interesting way, like it, it soaks up bile acids mm. in the gut mm. um, and your liver uses cholesterol to, to create these bile acids. And mm -hmm. so... You know, when you have more dietary fiber, um, when you when you ingest more fiber, it actually upregulates um, what are called LDL receptors on the surface of the liver. So it actually helps your liver become more effective at recycling cholesterol. Mm. Um, these these actually lipoproteins to be more accurate. Yeah, which is important because you know these lipoproteins when left in circulation for too long, that's when they start to get smaller and smaller and smaller, which we think is actually more risky from the standpoint of um, these lipoproteins' ability to get, or likelihood rather, of getting stuck in the endothelium. Right. Um, so you want your liver actually to be recycling LDL mm. efficiently, and mm -hmm. so fiber can help with that. It also can help bind to toxins in the gut so that you poop them out. Mm. Um, so there are many, uh, aside from the digestive, the, the purported digestive benefits of consuming more dietary fiber, there's a lot of other um, important health benefits. You know, mm. my friend, Dr. Joe Zandel, he's a cancer expert. He talks all about how fiber... I saw this video. Yeah, there's this evidence week. that fiber yeah. can can help reduce cancer risk yep. um, and things like that. So I do think that fiber is important. Yeah. But um, the way that it's often presented by these dietary evangelists is that fiber, we should be consuming fiber at the expense of animal protein. Right. Which doesn't make any sense. Yeah. You know, we can have both. We can have both in, the, in, a, in a healthful diet. And actually, studies show that when you do when your diet is of high quality whether or not it includes animal products mm -hmm. your risk for poor health outcomes 
is diminished. Right. If not altogether attenuated. So, yeah, so I'm a big fan of, of dietary fiber, primarily from whole foods, fibrous right. vegetables and the like. Yeah. Um, you were saying about Dr. Pran. What, what was, what's, what's the deal with that podcast? What's it about? Oh, man, he's it's the about goat. how disease starts in the gut. Is that true? Yeah. So, I mean, it's about that's what that's kind of how we started. We started talking about the the sort of gut cardiovascular gut brain axis and how mm. important a healthy microbiome is. But then he gets into all these, you know, broader societal, um, you know, implications of uh, where we're headed as a society and, and why he, he believes that we're all being pushed towards these, you know, really low nutrient density, um, high margin diets. Mm -hmm. And uh, he's just a really, he's a very philosophical thinker and he, you know, which I think is rare for medical doctors. He really kind of has a, a very firm grasp on the whole picture mm. of human health, right? Mm -hmm. A lot mm -hmm. of medical experts, they, you know, they focus on their area of expertise, mm -hmm. right? Um, neurologists, for example, you know, they've been trained to believe that the, that the, that the origins of brain disease are to be found in the brain. Yeah. But, you know, we're starting to see now that that's not necessarily the case, that the siloing off of all of these different areas of expertise and the reductionist approach that, that mainstream Western medicine has long taken has actually been to the, to the detriment of human health, right? Like yeah. the gut plays a role in immune function. The gut plays a role in cardiovascular health. The gut now we're starting to see plays a role in brain health. And we, don't have, we certainly don't have all the answers. I mean, we're just at the very tip of the iceberg in, in terms of understanding all of these many different relationships. But mm -hmm. nonetheless, I think it's really important to be mindful that those relationships exist. Yeah, yeah. Um, and so, yeah, that was a really, really great episode. My take on the Western doctors is that uh, whatever they specialize in, they just think is the center of the universe. Yeah. Like, you know, you had your dentist on the, I loved that guy, by the way, the dentist. Yeah, I loved that episode. But it's like the, the mouth is the center of health and like you know you talk to a neuro it's like the brain is this and it's like the gut like the gut is the center of everyone's like podiatrist like feet and, you know it's like guys no like you're all you got your specialty but that's not the fucking center yeah you know yeah i mean you brought up the the cast of characters in the in the miniseries and you're right all of them pretty much all of them are well known to have uh leaning towards these plant focused diets, right? Mm -hmm. Like the first episode of the show, T Tim Spector. I've had him on my podcast. He's a brilliant guy, mm. but he's, you know, that just because somebody is brilliant in their domain doesn't mean that they're right in every domain. Right. And Tim Spector, I think is incorrect about his assertion that we already get enough protein, protein. as oh, it is. Yeah. yeah. It's madness. I think he's it's one true. of these guys in the low, we should be eating less protein right. camp. And he's wrong about that. Mm -hmm. Other nutrition experts that I've seen on social media have have taken him to task to, right. to defend that assertion. Yeah, I saw Bioland take him down about yeah. that. That was great. Yeah. And I, did, I, did, I just think it's like also you have to consider sometimes when you're watching this at home and you're watching these influencers, some of them probably want a differentiating factor. You know, they're like, How, what could I say? Yeah. <laughs> That'll really get me some attention. I'm going to go on Stephen's podcast. Is that his name, Stephen? Stephen something. Yeah. You went on it. Diary of a CEO, yeah. Diary of a CEO. And I'm going to say some... Bartlett. Yeah, but I'm going to say some outlandish shit. <laughs> I'm going to say something that will upset everybody. Everyone's over-proteined. Like, it's like, really? <laughs> what? <laughs> like, no one has ever taken that approach. Uh, we're eating too much protein. I don't think that's been a problem in human history. Yeah. No, I agree. Like saying outlandish things, controversial things, it's definitely a way to get traction on social media. It's definitely a way to get a book deal. You're presenting a new idea. But the the vast, vast majority of people would be very well served. Just stick sticking to the basics, but actually sticking to the basics. Mm -mm -mm. Prioritizing dietary protein, which we know is the most satiating macronutrient. Mm -hmm. um, and, you know, a great way to edge out of your diet other sources of junk energy. Yep. Um, we know that it's important for the maintenance of muscle, for the growth of, of muscle, preservation of strength. We know it's crucially important. We know that sources of, of, of protein in the diet tend to, protein tends to ride alongside, 
alongside other very valuable nutrients, mm -hmm. right? Like when you eat a piece of grass-fed beef, you're not just getting protein. Right. You're getting the creatine. You're getting the carnitine. You're getting the carnosine. You're getting the taurine. You're getting the creatine. You're getting zinc. zinc you're getting B12. You're getting, mm -hmm. you know, carotenoids. You're actually, I mean, grass-fed beef is a great source of phytochemicals. Who knew, mm. right? But plant chemicals, right. you can find in abundance in the fat of grass-fed beef because they eat plants, right? right? So where do you think those phytochemicals end up? It's stored in their fat tissue, among other places. And so, yeah, the fact that we, that it's just this like reductionist, it's, it's referred to sometimes as nutritionism, mm. you know? And I think that that's where these, you know, these, these nutrition scientists, like they, they've spent all this money, they've dedicated all these years to, to, to building these reputations for themselves, right? So they have to, they have to defend their domain. Right. And, and they have to make it sound as though, right? Like they, you, you, they're, they're highly incentivized to make nutrition way more complicated than it needs to be for your average person. Yeah, kind of entertaining too. Yeah. Like they have to make it entertaining somehow. Yeah, exactly. There's uh, one of my favorite people online, I know he's a friend of yours, Ben Patrick, knees mm -hmm. over toes guy. Mm -hmm. What I love about Ben is he has five things to say and he has not stopped saying them for the last 10 years. And so anytime I send, you know, when I, when I train people and they've got knee issues or ankle issues or whatever, I say, you gotta go check out knees over toes guy and he's not trying to do anything new. He's just posting the same thing over and over again so that anybody who comes in at any moment is like, oh, okay, I get it. And this, this isn't a person who's trying to re reinvent the wheel that they made 10 years earlier. He just keeps kicking it out. And unfortunately, whole food, a whole food diet approach isn't getting any sexier. <laughs> like you've got to kind of like continue to think, well, what else can I say? Like, but it's like, that's why there's no agenda involved in it. Like it's like, cause it's not, hot it's not making anybody a shit ton of money yeah you know yeah uh and so no agenda seems to be find people with no agenda who don't always have to be reinventing what they said previously or saying something outlandish yeah. like oh like coffee's bad for you or some shit it's like uh, it's like let's well let's be done with that yeah and, so, and sometimes reputation preservation is the agenda mm. you know like the fact that somebody is a PhD in nutrition science, for example, like sometimes the agenda is just to maintain dominance and authority in their, in their field of, uh, of choosing. Yeah. And, um, and that in and of itself can be a bias. Right. Right. Yeah. So yeah, I think it's, it's super important for people to always be questioning, to not be, never be afraid of questioning authority. Right. Yeah. It's super important. I wanted to ask you about the, you know, the, the, their overall diet satisfaction. Why do you think that that is so important. Well, you have to enjoy your, you have to enjoy what it is that you're eating, right? right. Like if you're not enjoying your diet, you're just like, you know, if like, I mean, from a content standpoint, I've never wanted to create the spinach show. You know, it's something that I've always said because if you're creating content that is informative, you know, you could be the best science communicator in the world, but mm -hmm. if your content is boring, people just aren't going to watch it. Yeah. Right. You can be making the healthiest dishes at home, but if you're, but if you're only going to be able to adhere to your new healthy way of eating for a week or two weeks or maybe a month mm -hmm. at most, mm -hmm. then it's not gonna have an impact on your health, right? Like your health is determined by many things, but from a dietary standpoint, it's what you eat day in and day out. It's about your dietary pattern as a whole. Mm -hmm. And that's why, you know, single food, the occasional indulgence, right? It's not really that big a deal in the grand scheme of things. You mm -hmm. just don't wanna make it a habit because yeah. it's how you're eating day in and day out that really, you know, has the more measurable impact. Do you think 80, 20 is good? I think 80, 20 is good. Yeah. I mean, I probably do more like 85, 15, yeah. 90, 10, depending, yeah. on the, depending on the week. I'm 90, 10, and then some days like 80, 20. Yeah. Yeah. What are like your fun foods? We, we, we order in once a week. We get like Indian hmm. or uh, Thai or something or burgers, you know, just like once every while, like, just like we've got to enjoy ourselves. You yeah. Know? And we do enjoy ourselves. We eat great food, like we eat great soups and stews and steaks and all that stuff. And we, we love it. And I think that's probably part of the satisfaction idea is like every time you get up to go and eat, are you like, oh, this sucks. That would suck. Yeah. A huge proportion of your life is eating. Yeah. Like it's probably like what, a th five years of your life, mm. if you live to 70, is spent chewing. Yeah. So... Are you enjoying those five years? It's pretty damn important. Super and super yeah. important. Yeah. And I think most people, they've trained their palates to expect these hyper palatable lab made creations. Yeah. 
but um but once you get off that that IV <laughs> yeah of um of whatever it is the food industry is telling you you ought to eat mm-hmm. and you reacquaint yourself with real whole foods i mean to me there there is nothing more delicious than just a steak with yeah. like some good quality salt yeah like i just love that so much yeah totally well you know? cooked and yeah even ground beef i love i love ground beef oh and God. a lot of people might be out there like going oh like how do i make this interesting for myself it's like it doesn't have to be bland and boring all those spices that you see, paprika, you know, garlic powder, onion powder, cumin, turmeric, anything you want to put on there, it's fair game. It's like zero calorie. Enjoy yeah. it. Like it's probably full of phyto, uh, good antioxidants. Chow down. Don't don't muck around. It doesn't have to be bland. You exactly. Know? Exactly. Yeah. Even like fruit, you know, fruit is so, I've like rec- very, I'm 41 years old. I've never enjoyed pears. Mm-hmm. I recently discovered Danju oh, pears. Danju. Do you know them? J'adore Danju. They're so good. Yeah. No, do you actually know them? Yeah, of course. They're amazing. It's like a French, I just love the name Danju more yeah. than anything. But Feel it is fancy. a fantastic, uh, it is a great pear. There's a great article. I know that you're fans of, a fan of Alain de Baton. Yeah, I love him. Okay. He's a modern day philosopher for anyone out there who's never listened, but he has a, um, an article about eating a fig and it's about how to eat a fig slowly and enjoying every bit of it. Whoa. And so it's like this cool idea that when you eat, like slow down and like be aware of what you're doing and be aware of the textures and the flavors and be present with your food. Hmm. And, but it was like the article is just about a fig. Wow. And I thought it was pretty great. I highly recommend it if anyone wants to read about it. Well, you just Google it? Yeah, Google up. It'll be Alan Debaton. It's A-L-A-I-N-D-E-B-O-T-T-O-N. Yeah. Fig. It'll be there. Wow. I'm yeah. very impressed whenever, whenever anybody knows about Alain de Botton. He's yeah. just amazing. He's like a modern day philosopher. I love him. Yeah. Fantastic. I read a great book of his. There's the story of the marriage story, I think it's called, which was really depressing. Mm. <laughs> but for anyone who's like open to the idea that romance is both depressing and glorious it's a great read and there's another book called status anxiety which is also by him worth reading it's all about how when we got out of the caste system which was like oh your dad's a butcher you're gonna be a butcher when we got out of that system and we were like you could be a doctor if you want it messed us up mentally Hmm. like it absolutely was like oh the minute that you were given the option to be able to fight for a better life or a better status position that's when mental health problems started and america the birth of america because the rest of the world was still on the caste system was the 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 birthplace of mental health issues wow yeah (laughs) which is amazing damn it's pretty good i i i I read it like 15 years ago i still talk about it one of my favorite books of his is called on love Mm. Great book. And then The Art of Travel. Oh, yeah. 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 Um, he was actually just on Diary of a CEO. I know. Which is cool because he hasn't, at least until now, may, been on pot. He hasn't like... He has the school of life, which is in his, his, an Instagram that I don't know how much of it is him, but he owns that company. And so they'll just write, follow on Instagram, the school of life. And they just post interesting content about, you know, ways to be more thoughtful and present in your life. Like The Art of Travel. Um there's a great on on Instagram. You can kind of on, on sorry on their YouTube. You can look up these breakdowns of all the philosophers and kind of what their deal was. And there's one about watering your own garden. I'm trying to think about which philosopher that was. But if you were to type in "school of life" into YouTube and water your own garden, you'd find whatever the philosopher is I'm talking about, who I'm blanking on. But it's just one of the best stories ever. I think. The story of watering your own garden was that this philosopher was traveling through Turkey and they there was a huge um, problem at the mosque and all the politicians were fighting with all the religious leaders and it was crazy in Istanbul. And the philosopher saw this guy sitting on the side of the road, just out the front of his yard, relaxing. And he goes, aren't you worried about what's going on down at the mosque? He goes, no, I water my own garden. Hmm. Took him inside, he had this beautiful garden watered it himself and like this all these fruits and brought out all these incredible like snacks for him from his garden and it was like i i remember reading that in 2020 and going that Hmm. because everything was going wrong in the world and i was like and then i i had a garden in 2020 and i was like what am i own garden (laughs) pay less attention to what's going on out there things that i can't have an effect on really and pay more attention to loving the people around me watering them 
watering my relationship with them, watering my garden. Hmm. You know? Yeah. Yeah, you got to secure your base first. I, but I love that. I love, it's so true. Yeah. Yeah, he's masterful. I love Elaine de Baton. Mm -hmm. Tell me about B12. What the hell does it do? They always talk about it with vegans. Yeah, well, it's a uh, it's found primary it's it's found exclusively in animal products. Mm -hmm. So I mean, off the bat, if you're if you're going to adopt a vegan diet, then you're cutting out B12. That's mm -hmm. something that you're going to ultimately need to supplement with. Um, and it's a really important vitamin. It's an important vitamin for brain health, for mental health, mm. um, cognitive development. Uh, I believe it's involved in the production of stomach acid. Mm. We actually require stomach acid to properly absorb it. Mm. I recently found out, my dad found out that he is um, low in vitamin B12, but my dad's been on proton pump inhibitors, which are like antacids, like oh. um, for years at this point. Just um, taking them by like those those pills, like yeah. calcium pills or whatever they are. What are they? What are they? What are those? Yeah. Things? So there's like Tums. There are uh, like yeah, yeah. Uh, alkalinizing mm -hmm. um, chewables that I think you, you can potentially take. And so he takes a, those often, doesn't if he? You, if you have like reflux, he takes, yeah, I think he takes those, but then he also takes like, you know, one of these like over the counter PPI drugs, mm. which we know put you at increased risk for um, low B12 and possibly even increased risk for dementia. I think there was a, there have been a few studies to elucidate a connection between chronic PPI use and mm. increased risk for dementia because B12 is a really important vitamin for the preservation of, of brain health. Wow. And you need stomach acid to absorb that among other nutrients. You need stomach acid for mineral absorption and mm -hmm. the like. And, it, um, and it did show in this study that the vegan group had 64% less vitamin B12 than the, than the omnivores. Yeah. I mean, so, I mean, that's, that's, <laughs> that's a, a, that's a significant data point, you yeah, know, and, and the, and the study, the trial, which we didn't even mention, but it was, it was a short term study. It only lasted eight weeks. Mm -hmm. Right. And so again, this is just another one of those data points that might get swept under the rug. Like, right. oh, vegans can just, you know, they can, well, they can supplement with vitamin B12 mm -hmm. or what have you. But we don't actually know over the long term how that, you know, how that's going to play out, assuming that there is no supplementation, right? And yeah. why would you want to adopt a diet anyway that requires supplementation, yeah. right? Like my diet doesn't require any supplementation. I supplement, I enjoy taking supplements, yeah. right, to augment my performance yeah. and, you know, I have certain goals. Yeah. Um, and, we're lucky and enough to be able to do it. Like it's all there for us. Exactly, yeah. exactly. But when consuming a, a nutrient dense, di nutrient replete diet, I mean, there should be no need to to supplement. Supplementation should be supplements should be seen as supplements, right? Yeah. To to augment to yeah. You know, if you want to, um, or or for convenience sake, right? right? But to be on a diet that creates deficiencies, and then to you know adopt this sort of nutritionism approach of it's like that meme of the water tank that has like a crack in it and you see somebody like slapping. Yes. I don't know what that meme. Yeah. But it's like yeah. essentially that like, yeah, we, there are so many nutrients in animal source foods that are, you know, whether essential um, or conditionally essential. Mm -hmm. And that list is is evolving as it should, you know, as we learn more about nutrition. Um, but you know, to, to deprive your body of the nutrients, the, the constellation of nutrients that we know that our ancestors relied on evolved with, to me, it just doesn't make a lot of sense. Mm -hmm. And of sense. the bioavailability of whole food vitamins. Yeah. Or like when you get it from a whole food. Yeah. But there's some, I guess this may not be scientific, but there is something maybe a little bit mystical about why is that that vitamin completely bioavailable to me in this source yeah. when it isn't that bioavailable? For instance, um, iron in spinach, not bioavailable. It's not, yeah. Iron in meat. Yeah. Highly bioavailable. Yeah, you, know? you can take vitamin C supplements to improve the bioavailability of iron, but even protein is not as bioavail bioavailable in in whole food plant form. Right. Even Lane Norton just posted a study sharing uh, on Twitter uh, a study that found that in the post workout setting, you know, when protein and calories were controlled for, animal protein led to higher a higher um, rate of muscle protein synthesis as mm. compared to the same amount of protein in a whole food plant-based meal. Right. It's not to say that um, plant protein powders are not as bioavailable. As bioavailable, They're more processed. They're in a way pre-digested. Mm. Um, but we know that protein is more bioavailable, um, more easily digested, right? More fully digested in its, in, in its animal source form. And so, yeah, I mean, it's, it's, it's crucially important um, for all people 
but you know, people change over time. It becomes even more important as you get older. Mm -hmm. Um, people as they get, as they age become less sensitive to leucine, uh, which is the, you know, one of the key amino acids that is, that is, that plays a a role in muscle protein synthesis, Mm -hmm. stimulating muscle protein synthesis. And so, yeah, I just, you know, at the end of the day, I don't care what anybody eats. Like people listening, you know, eat whatever the hell you want. I don't care actually. I'm not emotionally invested in what other people eat. Unlike, <laughs> unlike, I'm not, I'm not about to stand outside with a picket sign outside of vegan restaurants for right. my, for what I believe to be true about diet. Yeah. I don't care. Right. But I do want people. What I do care about is people choosing their diets with full informed consent. Yes. That's my, that's my whole shtick. Yeah. And if they've been swayed by propagandists and activists and politicians, that's not good. And yeah. people need to be made aware of when they've been lied to. Yeah, a hundred percent. Yeah. So in the end, a documentary directed by a vegan, funded by vegans, and based on a study done by a vegan, mm-hmm. miraculously, miraculously has come to the conclusion that we should all be vegans. Is it is that surprising? No, and and also, but when you look into the study, doesn't really show that veganism is better. <laughs> it really doesn't. It doesn't yeah. really show it at all. It shows that one marker fell that they really cared about, yeah. but everything else wasn't really the same. Mm. You know, they lost weight that was probably muscle. Their vitamin B twelve wasn't good enough. Their HDL dropped, which is the good cholesterol. Their triglycerides went up. They were not happy eating it. Like all of them, other than one who said they may continue it, were not happy eating it. You know, I, I, I wouldn't have released the study. Like if there was no documentary been made about it, they must have felt a little bit awkward about it. Like, <laughs> well, we better keep making the documentary because they put all this money into it. I wouldn't have released the study if I really wanted that, like to show the world that veganism is better. I would have been like, let's just hide this one, mm. you know? Yeah, and it's unfortunate. It's like, it's unfortunate that I don't know. I don't. I don't know why Netflix continually seems to get behind these kinds of agenda-driven diet documentaries. Because mm-hmm. this isn't the first, right? There was Game Changers, which, mm-hmm. I, if I recall correctly, I could be wrong, but that was a Netflix original yeah. documentary. Mm-hmm. I don't know why Netflix continues to get behind these so clearly biased documentaries when you could easily do a documentary about the the problems associated with the food system and 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 what's really going on with public health without being so without without being so biased and yeah. presenting such an extreme fringe mm-hmm. convoluted viewpoint there were moments where i was like oh yeah we're on the right track ultra processed foods they mentioned that and they're like oh it's cuz of saturated fat from animals in processed foods i'm like wait what um and so there were moments where I'm like yeah I'm like, i agree i agree oh no i don't agree anymore <laughs> you know i think the thing with netflix that i actually kind of admire is that yes, they'll have these, you know, plant um, based propagandists, but they'll also have Dave Chappelle. Hmm. They're also like, actually, fuck everyone. <laughs> like, we don't care. We're just gonna put everything out there that we think is gonna work, you know? Yeah, you, you gotta respect that, I suppose. Yeah. But I do hope that at some point in the near future, we do see a little bit more truth and honesty with regard to, you know, the diet stuff. Because at the, cause at the end of the day, like these documentaries do reach a ton of people. Like, what you are, what you eat. Last I checked, it was number three in terms of trending TV shows in the U.S. Mm-hmm. And I mean, from as the standpoint of somebody with a with a large nutrition focused like following, you know, I do get a lot of questions about it, and a lot of people do in their own lives. A lot of friends, loved ones, do make the switch based on watching these kinds of films. You yes, know? yes, yes. And so I do think that it's kind of a shame the the potential for harm seems to be under so underappreciated yeah um but who knows you know then they'll put up something by ricky gervais which i love and, yeah. and shane gillis who's amazing yeah, and, you yeah. Know, all these like more based you know, <laughs> comedians and, and other forms of content you yeah know, so uh, you know i think you know the only thing we could do possibly if we wanted to stop watering our own, our own garden and go and do something about it i guess we could uh, first person who comes to mind is kelly is it kelly means is that his Callie name means he's great yeah i'd want to get him yeah. I'd be like, what do you want to talk about, bro? You used to work for Coca-Cola. He's done, you've done a great podcast with him. You used to work for Coca, Coca-Cola. You know exactly what the problem is that's going on with America right now. Let, let's just talk about the exact problem mm. and present the solution, which is whole foods. And don't do it with this agenda and really be honest. And what if we, what if we kept the standard high? And we were like, instead of having that, that woman on who said in, with, throughout human history, people haven't eaten meat <laughs> and gone, well, don't put that in there because that's bullshit. What if we made a, like a, a documentary that we could be proud of and go, oh my God, this is great information. 
you know, and if we can somehow swirl people up into the way to do that is to show people who are, who are dying from, you know, from terrible diet choices, like show like people who've made the wrong dietary choices and now have to like inject themselves with insulin a few times a day. Yeah. Like show we, we can emotionally whip people up without lying to them. Anyway, we should we should have this conversation off air now. We've <laughs> given away our secrets of what we're going to do for world domination. But I just think that like why isn't somebody making an honest documentary? Yeah. That doesn't have to do it over f- like let's make it in less than 2 hours so you don't have to watch four four episodes of it. <laughs> It's like, it's unnecessary. You could have just told us this information in an hour. Yeah. You know, let's just do an honest one that doesn't waste people's time. Let's do it. I'm down. Sign me up. Yeah. Yeah. Love it. Well, Luke Cook, always fun. This was great. Thanks for coming in, bro. Pleasure. Yeah. Always a blast. Hey, if you like that video, you need to check out this one here and I'll see you there.